Okay, so welcome everyone. We are so glad to host you for this uh, public conversation with uh, our fellows at the Food and Climate Shapers Bootcamp organized by our Future Food Institute, FAO, and uh, also supported by the Google Food team and many other amazing partners. So I'm super glad to host two big friends of our community tonight to co talk about one of the most uh, fascinating uh, topic from my perspective. That is, uh, of course, related to how food plays a crucial role in city and how it's connected with education, with the health of our community, the health of kids, and of course, uh, the health of our future, because kids and families represent the future for us. So welcome, welcome, uh, Robert Graham and Stephen Ritz with us tonight. Hello. Greetings from New York. Buongiorno! And in your honor, I have with me also my cheese hat. Oh, because uh, when it. you talk with Stephen Ritz, you need to wear your cheese hat. <laughs> Not necessarily, but it's very flattering. Steve, I need this one of those. I, I got you, man. I got you. It's just a bit hot in these days. So yeah. now I want to start from you. So please introduce yourselves. Tell what you do, who you are, what's the role you play in your communities. And then from that, we start our conversation. Go ahead, Dr. Rob. Oh, thanks, Steve, because it's hard to follow you, brother. It's hard to follow Steve Ritz. <laughs> so, so my name is Rob, Dr. Rob. I'm also a trained chef. Um, I've been a doctor in um, internal medicine and also integrative and holistic medicine for almost 20 years. Actually, this is my 20 year anniversary of being a doctor. Um, I've always believed that, you know, in healthcare and seeing patients, I've developed my own little small community of people um, that I've taken care of probably thousands of people over my career. Um, the thing that I really like to focus is on is that if you understand the nature of a doctor, the doctor is a teacher. So in, by nature, I'm an educator. And so every single patient I see, both in the clinic and also on stage as I travel, I'm really hoping to embark a lesson. And I think when you talk about food and food and education, you know, it's hard to talk about it without thinking about the environmental impact, the health impact, the societal impact, the economic impact. And so what I try to do in my practice is really try to develop a very interesting model um, where we look at patients in more than just the disease or the symptom. And I think that's really important. I think ultimately what we try to do in healthcare and particularly in my practice, I didn't say medicine, I said healthcare, is that we try to bring more health and care. And we do that simply by developing a very interesting model that my wife and I developed called FRESH. You know, and I think we need a fresh start in healthcare. We need a fresh start in life. And it, it's an acronym for our five ingredients in your recipe to health. Food, relaxation, exercise, sleep, and happiness. And I think if you have those five ingredients, medicine is of little or no need. And I think the sooner that we learn those five ingredients, so five principles, the better off we'll be as we grow up to avoid a lot of the diseases that we face in our communities that are completely reversible, treatable, and preventable by adopting a fresh lifestyle. That's what I got. That's all I got for you guys. Thank you so much. And actually, I would love to introduce you one day, Dr. Rob. I would go on and on and on and on and on. Rob's a real hero of mine. Um, <laughs> so I always get excited when he talks, for sure. That's so, true. That's true. Yeah, I do. And I please, really do. Steven. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, this, this is like the love bubble. It's the internet love bubble. Um, you know, it's like Tinder for already married people who just love working with each other. Uh, you know, all you want to do is swipe yes, swipe yes. So my name is Stephen Ritz. I'm an educator. I'm an urban farmer. I am the wearer of the cheese hat. And I like to say I grow vegetables. Our vegetables grow students. Our students grow schools and our schools grow communities. But I am somewhat of a serial entrepreneur and also a bit of an urban upstartist in that, you know, my whole life is dedicated to making cities more livable, more breathable, more breathable, um, more equitable, and more resilient. And I believe all of that starts with the single biggest lever in the world, access to healthy food and public education. 
So for me, the two are very entwined. I'm a big believer that children will never be well read if they're not well fed. So giving children access to healthy, fresh food where they need it most in school to activate their minds and bodies has a triple bottom line for communities, for schools, for families, and most importantly, for the planet. Because at a young age, if you teach children to eat healthfully and responsibly, great things happen. That's great. So in this group, together with me in the journey of the Digital Bootcamp, actually, we are all very much inspired by role models like you two, for example, and uh, all, all the guys sharing uh, this round table with us today have dreams, uh, are doing things, uh, want to make their impact exponential. They want to change the world. We want to try to leave a kind of a positive impact. But the, the difficult thing sometimes is where to start, how to start. And considering your experience, can you share a little bit how both of you started your journey? When did you start it? What you found in your neighborhood, in your community? Which were the obstacles you faced? Uh, I, I'll jump in really quick. I, I, I think the story that I would like to share is kind of a unique kind of multicultural, multi-global. Um, you know, I had the great fortune of being raised in a community here in New York City called Jackson Heights. And I had the amazing opportunity that the world moved into my neighborhood growing up. And so I never had to travel around the world to explore the cultures, the culinary, the, uh, the feelings that many people around the world have because fortunately, again, in New York City, the world came to us. And I, re I really remember, um, obviously I've always wanted to be a doctor. And I found something fascinating about the whole experience is that every single person, every single society, every single community has their own belief around health and healing. And unfortunately, in conventional Western medicine, it usually ends in the hospital where you would get a drug or a pill or a surgery. And what I have found throughout my both early lifehood experiences and then I went to college to study anthropology and I studied medical anthropology. But again, understanding that I wanted to be a doctor, I found that, you know what, there was so much we can do in healthcare to avoid a pill. And I figured that during my training, I would explore these opportunities. And so as a very young kid, how did I start? This may sound very old. And um, I actually opened up the white pages or the yellow pages. And I remember looking for an acupuncturist, a biofeedback, a chiropractor, an energy worker, uh, a holistic doctor. And I started just interviewing and working with them while I was in medical school. And I found that, you know what, they work, but they have to be integrated with the conventional medical model. And that is how I started. I started out literally by looking in the phone book before there was the internet and calling people. But I found one thing fascinating, and I'm just going to say this, is that every single doctor I've ever encountered started with a very simple question, what do, you, what do you eat? Because we believe, they believe, that it has a direct impact into our health. And unfortunately, many doctors in the conventional model never ask you that simple question. And obviously, it has a lot to do with where we live, what we can afford, how we prepare our food, how we cook it but I think we have to return to the problem. And as Steve knows, food is the problem, but it's also the solution. And I think healthcare and medicine has to adopt a food first approach. And that's why we started Fresh Med. That's amazing. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. And now, Steven, what so, did you find when you started in the Bronx? Well, you know, I'm not nearly my path was certainly not as deliberate or as intentional as, as Robert's. And what's really fascinating about Robert, and, he, and he's so humble and what draw, draws me to him, is that Robert got involved with the food notion at the, peak, at the peak of his career. So, you know, he was very successful in traditional eyes, you know, running a hospital, having some of the best patient efficiencies and some of the best success rates in the world. And then they say, do more. And he's like, you're taking the human out of the being. I, on the other hand, am the world's greatest failure. And I keep falling up the ladder of success. So I'm a very accidental success, 
But it also, you know, it really, I'm listening to Robert talk, it talks about the love of people. Um, you know, I grew up in a world, and I, I'm probably the oldest person on this conversation, in this conversation, although aging very well, I might add. Um, but I'm probably the oldest, I grew up in the age of civil rights and, and, and the whole, and the Vietnam War in the 60s, and all of that really impacted me. But I grew up loving people and using things. And in that process, I always knew somebody or a something or a place or a person I could go to for advice. And at a young age, I kind of learned that food is the language through which society reveals itself. And what I mean by that is who has access to what, where it's priced, who gets it, and where it is is very telling. Mindful, I grew up in a neighborhood that had a butcher, a baker, a fruit man who actually came around the neighborhood on a cart, a vegetable cart, um, you know, real mom and pop stores. Um, and, and, you know, food was everything in, in a middle class and, and it's driving community, you know, food was love. So to me, that's, you know, I've always had that notion, but then you kind of forget about it. You know, you go to college and what do you want to do? You want to meet girls and I wanted to go and play in the NBA. So along the way, I got very distracted from where I grew up with the whole notion of where I could go, where the world could take me as the world was becoming smaller and smaller. And while this is the last year that, you know, I'll entertain an offer from the NBA and I'm willing to get in shape, odds are that's not going to happen. So in the 80s, I wound up becoming a teacher, not by choice, but simply by default. I came home in a cast from my ankle to my hip. You know, I got hurt playing basketball overseas. And before I left, I took a test to become a teacher. And lo and behold, I passed the test. And so when I came back to the United States, I took the first job that hired me. And remarkably, I loved being a teacher. This was right before hip hop became popular. This was when people listened to radio. This was before cell phones. It was even before touch tone phones. Um, everyone had a rotary phone. This was before beepers. And there was always this sense of community of what people could do together. So I've always been in my own way, a very insurgent community activist. I've always surrounded myself by vast networks of people I love or people that I just wanted to associate with. A lot of that had to do with food. A lot more of it had to do with mischief. Um, a lot more of it had to do with the access to fair housing because there was such crises in the 80s and 90s in New York City around housing and sadly of um, substance abuse. I lost a lot of friends and colleagues and peers to substance abuse. And along the way, I started getting hungry. And I started really developing my craft, which was teaching, which was connecting with children, um, having nothing to do with food, but just loving to always eat with them. So I could be in a classroom with kids from 10 different countries and I'd make sure we had 10 different meals from 10 different countries. And I probably ate nine and a half of those meals. Um, to the point where, you know, at one point I was over 300 pounds. Um, the history in my family of diabetes, of heart disease, all of these things, you know, I never expected to live much past the age of 30, wound up catching up with me in the ages of, you know, 30 and 40, to the point where I had a heart attack, I was on tons of medication, I became a parent, I became bloated, and literally passed out in school in front of my daughter and was rushed to the hospital because of medic medical complications largely due to what I was, uh, the medicine I was taking. And then I started really learning about food. I had no idea what food really was. You know, you could talk to me about Italian food, Chinese food, he, uh, Jewish food, um, you know, Arabic food, all kinds of things. But I really knew, did not know where it came from, the inputs that went into it. And lo and behold, I started doing some community development work around urban farming, not food, but green roofs, green walls, landscape, and this whole notion that you could put things in the ground and really cool things would come out of them. And then that transferred over to an opportunity where my uh, gang students and I, uh, you know, went to a Whole Foods and we saw all of these vegetables and fruits and we saw people paying for them because for the most part, you know, in the 90s and through the first part of the millennium, all of my food basically came out of a bulletproof window or a bodega the size of my living room. Nothing, you know, the room behind me. You know, it was cookies, it was soda, it was chips, it was processed food, processed meat. And really, I was eating myself to death. 
And then when I learned about the possibility of growing food, I really became fascinated. It then became a lens into both environmental and social justice. And I have hence become an urban farmer. Um, I love growing food and growing people, learning about technologies, the ability to grow food indoors, the ability to grow food with limited space and limited water, reclaiming abandoned buildings, and the rest has been history. So that's a little bit of my background, and uh, it has literally taken me around the world. I'm the world's biggest accidental success. One day everyone's going to figure it out, and they're going to find out, you know, I, was, I just showed up and did the work. But it all starts with a seed. And that's the beautiful thing. You know, I, I was farming yesterday upstate on 300 acres, and I still marvel that you can put a seed in the ground and 30 or 60 days later, um, you know, have something to eat. I think about my work overseas. I do a lot of work in the Emirates and in Dubai and in Qatar. And I think of Sheikh Zayed saying, if you grant me agriculture, I will grant you civilization. And it's true. You know, agriculture was really beyond prostitution, the first economy in the world. I um, mean, when you think about why people went around the world, they went for food and spices and gold and riches, but really things to really please the palate, so to speak. So I think, you know, we're obsessed with pleasing our palates and we need to understand that. We need to think, how do we please our palates, please our bellies, but also do it in a way that is beneficial and respectful to the planet and the people who are back, break, breaking their back to provide us that healthy, fresh food. So that's a little bit about who I am and where I come from. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. I have to say that exactly one year ago, we were together uh, at your school, uh, visiting uh, and meeting your, your kids uh, at the school up in the Bronx. Uh, and at 721, all those children now have food handling certification, which exactly. is remarkable. I'm was super excited about that. Pretty special experience we had. And we have been really experiencing also how much uh, teaching to grow food can become really a powerful, uh, positive weapon uh, to reconnect with society because those kids uh, have different kind of diverse abilities. Uh, and uh, we saw how much they were connected and happy to socialize through foods. And now they are learning something that they can practice also in their, in their life. Then, of course, I've seen also the schools in Dubai, and I've seen your project being replicated everywhere in the world, as well as is happening with Rob, because just last week, uh, both Rob and I, we have been featured also in the most important uh, Japanese book. Uh, and on this Japanese book, featuring all the innovations around food and tech, basically, they are featuring uh, Rob's methods and Rob's approach. So my question is, uh, how and uh, what's the suggestion you can give to everyone that now really want to spread the good and start good project? Really, how did you make it from the local, really tiny example? Because you started small, uh, doing uh, what you were doing within your society and trying to better your society. And actually, now you are world recognized, both of you. You are expanding your knowledge and sharing your knowledge. and. My wonder is also how your projects uh, are so easily replicable. So the question is really how we can start from an idea and make a global impact like you're doing. I have an idea. I have an idea. So I just want to go back to one idea. So one of the things that Steve and I really connected with is that, um, and sorry, you heard me speak last year in Japan about this, is that throughout the world, our food that we serve in our hospitals is probably the worst thing. And the irony of that, right, is that you go to a hospital and you get the worst food possible for the same diseases that landed you in the hospital, which is amazing. If you have a heart attack, the next morning you can order a bacon cheeseburger, right? It's, it's, it's the, the, the most ironic thing. So I, I encourage young people to see these things that don't make sense to them and to challenge that status quo. Because ultimately, if you see something, you got to say something or else you won't be happy in life, right? And for me, one of the things that Steve and I connected with is that, you know, I started an uh, urban rooftop farm in, on a hospital. And that's what kind of made, really made a big splash, right? Because who would ever think in New York City, you can transform a hospital rooftop into a growing farm garden that serves the people in the hospital and only the staff. 
And that's probably one of the greatest things that I'm really proud about because again, everyone says no. And to the students out there, you have to be very comfortable with no's because throughout life, people will tell you no, 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 no. But if you believe in something or as a great John Lewis who just passed away this past weekend said, if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And I think that core, that thing, I th it's the spirit telling you to continue despite all the no's and it was gonna be a lot of no's. But also important is to have a plan as opposed to Steve's very humble way of saying that he's an accidental success story. I know that man, that man had an idea and he had it all planned out. He just didn't know how it was going to work out, but there was something that he was thinking about. And so I always say plan for the future, but prepare for tomorrow because ultimately tomorrow is not a given. But again, if you see something, you got to say something and ultimately your spirit will lead you that way because if it doesn't, you will have depression, anxiety, burnout as a mid 40 year old person in a job that they hate. So pursue that passion because ultimately you may get yeses and that yes has turned into a lot of yeses. And as you can see from Steve's example, it got him to travel the world, which is pretty freaking cool. Well, thank you for that. It's always nice to hear from someone else what I'm doing. Some days I just think that like I'm, you know, just getting up and being yelled at all day and banging my head out on the wall. But, um, you know, the method to my madness is simple. Don't talk about it, be about it. And that's easy. That's just the most important thing. You can talk, 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 but you got to do. And you don't have to do a lot, but you got to do something. So I always say you don't have to be great to start but you have to start in order to be great. And for me, it all starts, you know, with, with a simple idea, you know, how'd I get to be 320 pounds, one pound at a time? How'd I lose it one pound at a time? But I just, you, you look at things that are either adding value to your life or, or sucking the life out of you, literally. And those are the things that you want to amplify and minimize. So the first way, how I lost weight was literally Number one, I just decided to stop drinking soda when I learned how detrimental soda was to my health. And I saw that was the thing that I grabbed for the most, you know, those big 44 ounce sodas. And so I just got rid of it. And then I made small changes that added up. And I, I also believe that there are a couple of things. Number one, you're gonna hear no a whole lot, except from me, because I always say yes. But you will hear no from everybody. No is your best friend because no gets you closer to yes. And a lot of no's add up to the right yes. Um, you just have to be willing to persevere. The other thing is to really look at nature. Nature inherently succeeds. So what do seeds do? They seek to the, embed themselves in fertile soil and they seek water in the sun. And if you seek light and you seek water, you're going to do fine in the world. And then the other thing is really, no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. And you have to do that one thing that makes the most sense. I talked before about pulling levers. You know, you've got to think, what's the lever that you can pull? What juice is worth the squeeze in your daily life, in your daily practice, in your daily activities? And for me, I was a I was an insurgent for many years. I, I was like a fire hose with water going everywhere. I was angry about housing. I was angry about healthcare. I was angry about schools. And I, blah, 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 I had like verbal diarrhea. And I started realizing that you had to get in one lane and stay in that lane because if you want to lead, you have to give people a clear path for you to follow. And by staying in my lane, I've really been able to generate a lot of traction for myself, but also create a big following of people who want you know, to learn and also who want to support me. So I also believe you gotta give credit to everybody else. The people you give the most credit to are the biggest works in your life. Um, you know, and you very publicly praise them so people thank them for supporting your work and then they have to. I believe you celebrate often because everyone likes a good celebration. And you, you learn to embrace those critical moments in life that get you to the next step. Um, you know, you're never done, you're never resting, you're just taking an inflection point and thinking, you know, how do I get to the next level? That, those are really the critical, the critical benchmarks for succeeding in life, you know? And, and to be a seed, um, 
you know, ironically, when we put a plant in the ground and the plant doesn't grow, we don't blame the plant. We have to look at the environment. So what are the most fertile conditions for your ideas? Um, where will that idea have the biggest juice for the squeeze, so to speak? These are critical things that once you become adept, you know, there's only so many emails you can write in a day and only so many you can answer in a day. So you've got to be expeditious in all of these things that you do. Um, so it's being smart, but it's also sometimes taking the smaller steps that get you to the much bigger step. But be prepared to hear no. If you're not pre prepared to hear no, go work at McDonald's. And, you know, and they'll tell you, okay, in 30 days you'll get a raise. You know, in 30 days you'll get a raise. You know, the safe route is, is you know, be prepared to hear no a lot. And that's okay. No is a great course correction. I always like, well, why I, I, not? Yeah, I also think what you said is very important. It's half the time is, it's just showing up. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, have ideas like you mentioned and and say, I'm going to get there. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show up. But you know what? The reason why I always show up is because you always show up. And that's and, and eventually what you realize is that the same people that show up all the time is your tribe. And those are the people you need to connect because there's a lot of poisonous people out there. There's just like a lot of poisonous plants. And you have to realize and set your own boundaries that, you know, what you're going to surround yourself that's with really good other like-minded people because ultimately I, for here I know Sarah and I know Steve we raise each other up and anytime we show up we all show up and that's where I think the one of the most important things so oftentimes you don't want to be up there you don't want to you know get up early or stay late but I think half the time is just showing up is really important I couldn't agree with that more Rob thank you I mean you know the funny thing is you know Sarah calls I'm in you call I'm in and that's it um, and I'm delighted to do so because I feel it adds value to my day. So the other thing that I recommend people is, you know, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Um, you know, it's, it, you don't really have to do something today that you're going to thank yourself for today. Like, oh, let's go have a bacon cheeseburger. It's going to taste great. Oh, it's exactly what I want. But your future self isn't going to thank you for that. My future blood, <laughs> you know, I just had my CBC stuff. My CBCs are not going to thank me for that. Um, you know, so I always try and do things mindful that I'm not just working for today. I'm working for the future, and I want to do something every day that my future self will thank me for. Yeah, actually, from your words, I'm connecting the different dots. Uh, we started this journey really talking about the importance of understanding and knowing uh, what's our ecosystem and building the ecosystem step by step. Uh, and also talking about uh, which are the cultural obstacles that we face. Uh, sometimes are not just cultural obstacles, but sometimes are your local institution that instead of supporting your project uh, becomes an obstacle. And also talking about uh, the endless no that we are receiving uh, and also how people strategize. Of course, I'm also thinking about uh, the relationship between uh, local institutions and uh, your works because uh, both uh, schools and access to food and food apartheid, because we're not talking just about food desert, but we are learning in this journey that actually this things of the food desert is something that belongs it's from our history myth. and is uh, is a, has been actually is the result of bad political choices. Uh, so it's something intentional that intentional political choices, not bad, very purposeful, very self-perpetuating. A lot of people are getting very, very well paid off exactly. the dysfunction of our city. You know, and I'm looking at. So something that costs so much to the society because it's making people sick. And this links to what Rob's does. So I, I'm wondering really how from the bottom of the, of the community, we can really start to, let's say, start to influence the policy makers because uh, actually in our dreamland, I would love to have the schools manage like uh, Stephen is managing his school, teaching to the kids what Stephen is teaching and caring about their health, as well as I dream to have an hospital where I don't have just a doctor that is uh, telling me what to do after I get sick uh, instead of preventing my sickness. 
and doing actually and practicing uh, the the physician work like you're practicing so what do you think that we can do from our perspective to really start to influence the local policy makers well so i think policy you know you can't point, point a compass um for point, pointing north so i think policy makers follow people and i'm looking at jacinia's comment that you know people are eating more for immediate pleasure than for long-term health. And it doesn't have to be an either or, but there very definitely has to be an and but. So we need to understand that half the things that we're eating on a day-to-day -day basis, we shouldn't be eating on a day-to-day -day basis, that we are being marketed to, that we're being brainwashed. Um, and I'm not brainwashed with evil waves, so to speak, but you know, the media is a big thing and that people need to understand that food is not just about pleasure. It's really about sustenance. It's really about health. It is really about nourishment and sustainability. And when you start looking at food and eating like that and understanding the inputs that go into the food that we make and the cause and effect of the choices we are making as consumers, you start voting with your fork, your mouth, your wallet, and then at the ballot. And that makes a very huge difference. Um, you know, it's, I will tell you, there are certain things that I would love to eat, perhaps. Um, you know, I, I do enjoy the taste of beef, but right now I will not eat beef. I will not eat chicken. I will not eat pork. If it means I am putting another human being at risk for their life to help me get that meat. Um, to help me get that protein. And in the process, I'm making very ethical decisions that are game changing. I always talk about the example in my community when Wendy's came and built a new Wendy's in the community. It was a beautiful Wendy's, it was gorgeous. And you know, the whole thing with Wendy's is they refused to pay the tomato growers one penny more a pound for tomatoes. It would have been a game changing raise, one penny. And you know, children don't want pennies, they want dollars. So one penny is very minuscule to them, even in poor communities. But when they understood that those farmers weren't getting paid, we stopped eating at Wendy's. And that was game changing for me and my students. And every time I can prevent a burger from going in their belly and replace it with a banana or an apple or a piece of citrus or you know, some fresh greens, I feel a sense of moral victory and accomplishment that's not only better for the planet, but also better for business. Because what am I doing? I'm moving them away from packaged foods, processed foods, the mess, the manufactured edible synthetic substances, the crap, you know, the crap that, you know, they are so inundated with. And when children and people learn that they can grow their own food, this weekend I was away, every single thing that I consume came from within 150 feet of where I was sitting all 24 hours a day. And that's my nummy. You don't waste a thing. You number one, you don't waste a thing. The rest goes back into compost and to understand the inputs that are there and the seasonality of it all is really incredible. Yeah, and, and, uh, Rob, <laughs> please. Yeah, look. yeah. I so I always say I'm I'm a, I'm a proud son of an immigrant mother from a shithole country called El Salvador, right? So as our president said here, you know, calls us one of those beautiful uh, countries. But I'm also the son, the proud son of a farmer. And one thing that I was raised with is that why wait for others? Why don't you do it? And I think, why do we have to wait for the government, right? To tell us what to eat, what not to eat, where to be, how to do it. We can, take the, we can take the power back into the streets and into our own communities to be the change that will influence the policies. And the more and more people do that, the, the greater the politicians who are technically hired by us to represent us have to adhere and do the things that we want as a majority. So I, I couldn't agree with Steve more. The other thing too, is that I think we all have a global responsibility here. You know, my job as a doctor, meet people at the end when they are broken. And I believe that it is the responsibility of the people that feed us. And I think that's one of the reasons why I became a chef about three years ago. I became a full trained chef because I realized that people get their nutrition, not from a cookbook, but from someone that cooks the food for them. And so if I can actually offer a person 
good, healthy food as the default in our communities that is both delicious, cost-effective, as you know, Peter Close, right? Close, his cat model. It has to be convenient, affordable, and tasty. That's it. For something to be eaten over and over again, you have to make it convenient, affordable, and tasty. And the way we do that is by engaging more food vendors and food suppliers and chefs to help design that meal. The other thing is that I just want to say something that because I'm an educator, right? And um, my wife right now is literally is in a process of developing an online webinar um, and school. We developed a school called Fresh Med U. Fresh Med U is about the university. And the reason why we did this is because many people can't come to New York and see me, but we want to share the, the information with them. And FRESH is the acronym, as I mentioned before, for food, relaxation, exercise, sleep, and happiness. And it has to be very simple. And we have to take care of ourselves first, because why should we wait for anybody to take care of us besides maybe our parents, right? It, I think it's ridiculous that we have to wait for leaving the masks, mask thing now in the US. Why do we have to, to wait for the government to tell us that we have to wear a mask? Why don't we just take that initiative on our, on our own? And what we've done is actually develop a program, um, which Sarah, I hope to share with you in the next week, so that you can give your whole community um, online resource uh, free, uh, so that people can understand the very five simple ingredients. Food, when it comes to food, eat more plants, that's it. When it comes to relaxation, relax for 10 minutes a day. You need to give yourself a break. Exercise, you need to move for 30 minutes a day. Sleep, you gotta sleep. Steve, hear me out, seven to eight hours a night, and happiness, it doesn't matter how much money you make, how much fame we have, it's other people. Chris Peterson says it. And other people matter more than anything else in our happiness. And so those are our five simple ingredients. And we can all do that. And guess what? They're all cheap and they're all within your own power. And so that's what we're working on right now in terms of educating the masses. And be, oh, 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 um, we're going to be sending you, Sarah, um, uh, the free link for that that online program because I think it's very powerful. Thank you so much. Again, it, it's about it's about us changing them, not them changing us. Thank you. Yes, I really appreciate. So now a lot of questions actually are uh, are coming uh, in our chat, uh, and uh, I want to pick one that actually is from Julie, and she, she actually she's asking uh, how could the food industry help to adapt uh, to contribute to a healthy diet uh, and if do you think that processing slash preservation is out of our picture because then of course uh, we know that the 70 percent of the world calories we eat comes from hyper processed food processed foods, right so so the last three years i've been working with food companies in designing this what i find fascinating about the food industry is that they are a lot about the bottom line if you show them a market trend where the food, what people are buying, they're going to be producing more of it, right? And so one of the fastest things that I've been seeing lately is the explosion of whole food plant-based diets, going back to Steve's point, right? And so therefore, again, my message is eat more plants. That's all, I'm not telling you to do anything else, just eat more plants. But we're also starting to see that people are buying more vegan, vegetarian options and cutting back on meat. We can talk about sustainability and climate change and all that stuff too, but ultimately we're starting to see the trend. And if you're a smart business person, like many food industry, food companies are, they're going to have to modify their current way of doing business to adapt to making more money in the new future. I think preserving food, I think we don't know how to process it. Humans, humans are not processing centers. So therefore the great Michael Pollan said it best, if you can't read it, don't eat it. So if you pick up something and you don't eat it, that's why the beauty of a banana, Steve, a banana is simply a banana. There's no reading about the label. And so ultimately process and preservation is there to keep things alive artificially. Things should rot. And if they don't rot, you have a problem. Oh, yes. And what do you think about uh, Ayurvedic diet? Someone oh, is asking. Uh so, so part of my background is integrative and holistic medicine. So I had the great fortune of learning about Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic diet. And so Ayurvedic diet is fascinating because it is based upon your own constitution. And again, goes back to the, what Western medicine is missing. So an Ayurvedic approach looks at the whole being. 
how you sleep, how you eat, how you feel, how you sweat, and then design meals according to what they call your dosha. And there's three major doshas and they're online. You can take a dosha test and find out which dosha you're more likely. And we're not all just one dosha. We are bi dosha, tri dosha. And so depending on what type of year, what type of food is available and how you feel during that time, the appropriate diet will be designed by Ayurvedic practitioner for you. And that's the beauty of it, right? The beauty is that it's personalized, which unfortunately a lot of what we eat in America and around the world with processing is not tailored for your own specific needs. That's pretty interesting. If you have uh, any anything that you think we, we can uh, study more or any readings to share, we're happy to, to get the link. So actually jumping to the costs of uh, health, because what also Stephen is doing uh, is really something that is going to impact on the cost of the entire society. Because what we have seen, also the rating of students, how much eating well and growing food in school and get educated about growing food is impacting on their performances. Not only Absolutely. their health performances, but also their brain's performances, their commitment to go to school and so on. So did you ever count what's the impact of what you're doing, the positive impact, because you are preventing them to become, uh, say, bad adults, let's say, or anyway, adults that are going to be sick, uh, most probably are going to be living not in a, in a healthy environment and so on. Can, can you share with us a little bit, Stephen, what, what's the, what, what are the numbers? Because I think that the numbers that you were able to, to measure in this last 10 years are pretty impressive, just to show also how much is the benefit. But can, so, I, can I jump in there for one second, Steve? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this, this, is, this, is, this is something Feel that free. I think this is really important, right? Because ultimately, you know, industries want to look at the return on investment, how much money, right? And so, as I mentioned before, healthy foods, more plant-based foods are is in a moving market trend in the food industry. Now, the really sick problem we have in healthcare is that if people and communities are healthy, medicine doesn't make money. So that's where the big problem is, right? And so hospitals, pharmaceuticals, surgeons, they don't make money if people are healthy. So that's, you have to start thinking about where is the incentive for a healthier community if the machine makes money on illness? Steve, all yours. Yeah, I mean, literally in, in, the, most, in, in the most economically challenged communities, what do you see? You see the most fast food. You see the clown, the king, the colonel, and in between the clown, the king, and the colonel are the dialysis centers. So literally, it's because of what we're doing. It is an addiction prescription model that cheap food has become so expensive. Um, I noticed in, in, the, uh, in the chat column, there was someone who said, you know, I never want to market to children. You're exactly right, because that's how McDonald's actually took over the world. It was by the Happy Meal. It was the mommy, mommy, mommy factor. Now, in terms of Sarah's question, when I started working with younger children and I saw the kids who were the poorest performing children in the school or the most behaviorally disturbed, more often than not, they were obese. And more often than not, they were either hungry or had a really lousy breakfast. So when you understand the impacts of input on output and performance, it all starts coming together. Now, sadly, we have parents in our community who are feeding their children energy drinks for breakfast because they believe that they're giving their children energy. It's the marketing. And we've got to stop looking at our children for as epicenters of profit. And when we do that, when we take the big business and we take the advertising and the marketing it out of the equation, you really start looking at what is the benefit of food and what food is designed to do. It's designed to nourish, it's designed to fulfill, it's designed to satisfy, it's designed to hydrate. And you can look at ways the same way the, these big corporations design food and, and experiment on food, the way you feed children and see a dramatic 
increase in, in their performance and in positive eating behaviors, which then minimize all the other things like childhood obesity, childhood, you know, onset of diabetes. You know, 25 years ago, if I were to walk into a school and said, how many of you know someone with diabetes? Very few hands would go up. Now, all of my students' hands go up and they're all poor and they're all on public assistance and they're all eating cheap food because the body is not designed to consume this cheap food. It's just, it's not designed to grow from it. It's designed to inhale it and keep inhaling it and make you want one thing else, more. So we need to move away from the more mentality and look at better. I don't want to get back to normal. I want to get back to better. And when children understand the relationship between their own personal performance and their own personal labor and what they do in school, um, they succeed far better. So I am not anti-ice cream. I'm not the ice cream police. But I don't think that we need to invest millions of dollars in nutritional information and nutritional programming telling children that, you know, we can all agree that ice cream isn't a meal. It should be a treat. You know, I am not anti-potato chip. I love potato chips, but I think we should all agree that potato chips are not a meal. They're not an entree um, and they shouldn't be a daily snack. They should be an occasional snack. And when you start cultivating palates and mindsets like that, you start redefining the way children see themselves and the relationship to the world. And that's the most important thing. You're moving them from being consumers to producers. And that's the, crit the critical piece. Agreed. You know, the other thing that you might also, that's really fascinating is that the good food movement, the whole food movement, and the local food movement have also made healthy food really sexy. And what do I mean by that? I've yet to meet the child that grow, that wants to grow up and be the French fry maker at McDonald's. That's the worst job in the world, or the burger boy. You know, these are minimum wage jobs that are short-ended and have short lifespan and, and have a lack of esteem. But I now more than ever, because of the work that you're doing, Sarah, the work that Rob's doing, the work that I'm doing, and the local food movement, you're seeing people who really want to be chefs, want to be farmers, want to be herbalists, want to be confectioners. They want to create healthy, fresh food and opportunity. And more often than not, in some of the highest needs communities in the world, none of my students want to grow up and be the French fry guy, but everyone would love to be a celebrity chef. Everyone would love to make a healthy meal. So many of my students are really gravitating towards the urban farming industry because of how it treats their employees, the amount of dignity and respect, the amount of fair wage and living wage that goes into it. So these are things that are really cool um, and it's been game changing. But that has to do with us talking about food and redefining how we see it rather than saying, oh, I want something cheap and convenient off the supermarket shelf and let me get it quick and let me eat it real quick. Uh, in a car or, you know, while I'm talking and driving and, you know, without having a meal. The beauty, if you will, the sad beauty of Corona, of the pandemic environment, is that kitchen tables have become the new classrooms. And here we have an opportunity to sit around the table with a shared meal and to really move away from screens. You know, everyone is so screened out and so zoomed out that you can cook a meal together you can transfer recipes. You can look at what's sustainable. I am growing more food now, remarkably, in the pandemic than ever before. Number one, because That's people true. need it. Um, people want to do it. It's great project-based learning. Parents love doing it with children. Children love doing it at home. And it really creates a whole new lens and point of entry for absolutely everything. I mean, you know, down to the meal cards, we're creating things that I was sharing with you before. Um, really fun stuff. Rob, you missed it. I was sharing how, you know, we're cooking online, we're creating recipes, all this super local stuff that we're delivering to kids and turning it into a robust learning experience. Um, and it, it's really remarkable. We're connecting, we're putting, I like to say, the culture back into agriculture. Yeah, I, I want to pick uh, also a comment that Julie just did uh, uh, in, in our chat because, uh, of course, um, she says that 
actually uh, preservatives uh, mm. have been uh, also playing uh, a positive role within the food industry because uh, in the decades uh, in the past uh, we're actually preserving a lot of food that was about to go to waste uh, and of course uh, food science uh, have been also trying to do positive things because if we have to think about feeding the planet uh, we need to find a kind of a balance but while yeah. in these months uh, um, I think that the, the global pandemic uh, has been resetting a little bit the entire situation everywhere in the world highlighting all the dark side of the entire food chain really showing everyone that is a mess that needs to be reshaped from scratch. I think that many things have been changing. We have been seeing farmers left behind, disconnected by the chain. We have been seeing people just buying canned food instead of maybe procuring food from the farmers that were close by and many other things that happened during this pandemic. Another thought that actually we had is that um, Reflecting about our sociality, probably in the last 15 years, all our social moments were related to a commercial food opportunity. So if you think about the aperitivo time, we have the spritz and the aperitivo and we have brands that branded these social moments. We have uh, every kind of social moment that is connected to, of course, uh, um, marketing activities related to specific food. Of course, now with the lockdown, many things need to change. If you think about the, the, the Starbucks style, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, many bars have been my office. But of course, this is a lifestyle that was connected to some, some kind of um, marketing and eating habits uh, that were strictly connected to something that was connected also to specific product. Now we need to redesign that because the global pandemic uh, is, of course, limiting so much uh, our social life uh, in uh, closed space uh, overall in uh, restaurants, cafeterias or places like that. So probably also what you, Stephen, were saying, that is something that we have been seeing growing everywhere. We have been running several surveys in Europe, in US, in Asia as well. People during the pandemic have started working at home, of course, cooking three times a day at home, preserving food at home, wasting almost nothing, choosing better the food, eating better, growing food in the garden, and many, many positive things actually happen. So maybe in the next month ahead, if the pandemic is going to be something that is going to be with us for the next at least six to 12 months, we're going to start to reshape also our socialization around food. Probably we're going to start uh, socializing uh, around food in homes. That is something that was uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. I was uh, making a lot of dinners at home. Now I, I never have the opportunity to do it. And as well, also public spaces maybe are going to play a different role with uh, urban farming and so on. I don't know, but I, I feel that here there is a, an opportunity to catch. Oh, without a doubt. I do think that the pandemic is going to reshape the opportunity to really look at the urban landscape in a variety of ways. And perhaps the most important way is really to have blended communities. And what I mean by blended communities, I think, you know, I, I'm here to tell you that, and you know, Dr. Rob is even closer. He's in Manhattan. He lives in Manhattan. You know, the traditional restaurant model is dead. It's not going to come back. You're not going to see streets lined back to back with, you know, hundreds of restaurants. What I would love to see are now restaurants with nonprofits where there's policy that gives those high rent spaces tax write-offs for local landlords and local small businesses to create the kind of integrated communities that we need that nourish each other rather than compete for you know a butt in the seat with, with, with a high end um, with a high end entree. In some regards, this has been the great equalizer um, for for the restaurant industry and it's going to make us rethink the way we socialize the way we we want to spend our money how we spend our money and 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 do business it's been an inflection point that in a lot of ways while i certainly don't want to discount the amount of loss and pain anyone is feeling 
ultimately can bring the planet to a much better place. I also do want to acknowledge Yuli Menesi's comment about respectfully disagreeing about food preservation. Yuli, I actually agree with you, and I think it was more a matter of semantics. I think all of us are into preserving food respectfully, but not processing it into something that we don't know what it is. So I think everybody here is, is a huge fan of, of um, you know, fermentation, uh, of kombucha, of canning, uh, of all that good stuff with food, but just not seeing, you know, the raw ingredients, you know, like, look, a Twinkie comes from basically things under the ground. I think we're talking about getting rid of that. And I would love to see cities become more oriented towards the processing of food, small batch cooking, small batch processing. I'm looking at opening up a, a, a new facility. Oh, Sarah, you have no idea what's coming. I'll send you some pictures. You're gonna, you're gonna be a real, this, you're gonna have a mama mia moment when I get off the phone with you, I'm gonna send you our new facility. And half of the oh, facility, it's gonna be an 8,000 square foot garden, rooftop garden, and half of it, we want to teach people how to process food, how to package it, how to, you know, how to take this living product and do something with it besides just sell it live. Because listen, I love eating plants, I love eating whole food, and I love eating salad, but I can't expect everyone to do it three meals a day. However, if I can take those healthy local greens that I'm growing and create interesting ad value products and other ways of utilizing it, I'm going to create an ad value economy. I'm going to create more jobs and ultimately more consumption of the product, which is critical. Oh, wait till I send you this picture. You're going to have a, you're going to be a mama mia. I can't wait. I just would love to invite Evie to share her thoughts or question. Thank you, Sarah. It's for you, Dr. Hop, Robert. Uh, just I can get my mind around it. Uh, how did you convince the hospital to build a garden on the rooftop, like you were telling us in the beginning? And what were your arguments? And uh, what if you what was the food used for the patients? And uh, and then after that, how can we have more doctors mm -hmm. like Thank you? you. Oh, so sweet. Thank you for, for your comments and for uh, just being really kind. Um, so remember, no, 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 right? So how did I convince a hospital? I, let me start by saying this. Most large feeders have a contract with, I'm sorry, most, most, most large institutions have contracts with large feeders. So your hospitals, your schools have a contract with these large feeders. And the interesting part about that argument is that the longer the contract, the cheaper it is for the institution. So the CFO of a hospital, for example, wants the cheapest cost that they can actually um, justify, right? And so if, for example, Sodexo, which, which has done amazing things lately, um, Compass as well, done amazing things lately. Um, they are trying to get into a long contract. So trying to find someone to disrupt that chain is completely opposite of what their financial idea strategy is. So how I did, and I'll tell you honestly how I did it. And so I had this idea. So there has to be in New York City, if you go to my, I did a TED talk and that's how I met Steve. So I did a TED talk and if you go look at a TED talk, there was an abandoned rooftop. And for years before I always said, why isn't something grown there? Now, why don't we open it up again, first of all? And then if we're gonna open it up, why don't we make it useful? And so we took about a year to open it up and then finally transitioned into an urban farm. Now, if a contract, if the, if the institution has a contract with the feeder, they can't hire another contract. So similar to Steve, we started giving food away, right? So very few people will say, I won't take something free. And so that's how that first started. So we had enough money, we raised enough money so that they had no money invested in it. It did not affect their bottom line. But what we did, as soon as we opened up the garden, which we had to get the engineers, the, the financial institutions, and we had to find an urban farmer to help me do it. Um, then I called the press. Then I called all the media I can, right? Because now you have something beautiful in the middle of Manhattan on a farm, feeding beautiful, healthy food 
to the people and the patients of the hospital. Now, I would love for a hospital to say, hey guys, we're gonna want you to come back and film the destruction of it. And so I think it was the perfect timing when you do something good that you're really proud of and people resonate with it, tell everyone, call the media, call Sarah, you know, call me and tell me, hey guys, I'm doing something pretty cool. I think you guys should watch it. And so that's how I convinced them. I convinced them because I had the right plan. I had enough money and I had the right people who would say yes to me. And then I called the media to cover it. And that's how I quote unquote convinced them. And ultimately most people agree, right? We should be selling and offering good food to our patients. So to your question, so food to our patients, yes. And eventually they started selling it to, to started giving it to our patients. And actually it wasn't until I got an Italian uh, chef from Sodexo who really was using the bounty of the garden every single day. And he would email me and say, I want to use the basil for this. I want to use the lemon for bina for that. I want to use the thyme for this. And so ultimately that's how change happens um, because I think people are hungry for it. Now, in terms of why there's not more doctors like me, because number one, I think the time is not yet, but more and more doctors are. I belong to a community called Lifestyle Medicine and Integrative Medicine that really people focus on lifestyle as medicine. And I think more and more young people understand that connection, which I am totally mentoring and I love to include them into my discussions. And for the people that don't get it or don't want to get it, they're going to die anyway soon. So the sooner they die, the sooner that we can grow more. Big, big. There it is, Sarah. What's that? That's a building with a greenhouse on the top. Whoa, where? In the Bronx. Holy cow. That's a new one. So actually, yeah. before, there were a question from someone wondering actually if um, th this greenhouse uh, uh, on the top of the skyscrapers all over New York are anyway giving healthy food uh, or if the pollution rate is uh, too high and is damaging also the food. Do you know, do you have data related to that? So certainly, listen, growing food is like anywhere requires a certain amount of, of precision. Uh, the beauty about controlled indoor agriculture is you are literally controlling every single input um, from the air to the water to the light. You're in some ways, you know, some places we're on roofs because it's available space. But in many places, and a lot of the work that I'm doing in Dubai, and I can't wait for you to come visit, Sarah, is in basements. Um, I know. Dubai is a <laughs> city that was built basically in, in the past 30 years. And you have these incredible skyscrapers and people with two and three cars underground in a parking lot. Well, autonomous driving has changed all that. So now no one has a car because the cars are moving themselves. So you're going to see these luxury buildings having massive underground farms. Um, these parking lots under buildings are gonna be incredible farms with LED lighting, solar panels. It's going to be remarkable. Um, you even saw the work at Sustainable City where every single thing that we bring into the city has to serve more than one purpose. And that's really what I think is part of this whole circular economy and a better place for all of us. So, you know, you go into a bodega, you go into an average, so what's, what's the purpose of the product? The purpose of the product is to make money, end of story. It's to get people and get them to buy more. We want to move away from that model. And part of the things that we do at Sustainable City is look at the purpose behind it. What's the benefit? Listen, I love Rob's farm, but I don't know necessarily if I'm in the hospital, if I want to eat that food thinking, oh my God, I'm sick, the city made me sick. But I certainly want to look out my window and watch it grow and feel better. As a patient in recovery, let me tell you, I'd much rather sit on Rob's rooftop than in the TV lounge watching Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil pour more bad advice out of his ass. I mean, you know, to me, it's far more therapeutic to be outside and look at birds and bees and watch people interact than it is to watch more daytime TV. So there are, there are the kinds of benefits that happen. Now, specifically around urban farming, there are so many great new certifications that are out there and industry standards that really make this very, very, very safe um, and you know, reduce the amount of inputs tremendously. So we are, look, look at the, we now, this, just like wearing a mask, 
We have the ability to filter air. We have the ability to clean water. We have the ability to really sterilize things with UV sterilizers in ways that traditionally our very sloppy and selfish and input intense big ag is really contributing to the demise of the planet. So in a lot of ways, I certainly don't recommend eating food grown off the side of the highway. Please don't stay, that's not what I'm about. I'm, I'm all about looking at beautiful milkweed and looking at bees growing and all kinds of other things that we could do on the side of the highways. I'm certainly about well, more food and less lawns. But in terms of controlled indoor ag, you think about what is possible. Wow, it is game changing. And the use of input um, is so minimized, it, it's remarkable. Yeah, and I want to pick just uh, Eleni and Guillen questions because actually I have been uh, at, in Dubai where Stephen is running this amazing project uh, with Fair Green School uh, in the Sustainable City. And uh, over there, they are really prototyping uh, the kind of the society of the future in the Sustainable City. And it's a place where actually every single family has his own uh, garden uh, growing its food uh, and it's provided. Uh, and so they have their own fresh food. Every home is built together with uh, the garden where actually they're growing the food. So it's pretty interesting that this, this model and over there is working really well. And on the other side, they're wondering if you're going to be in Dubai for the expo that have been postponed, but... Uh, I know that, that you are going to be around. <laughs> so I will be at Expo. I'm working on being one of the living hosts at Expo. I'm also hoping to invite some of my friends and colleagues to come present. I, you know, the, the whole thing about Expo, remarkably, is that it needs, and this is a crazy number, it needs 60 million visitors to be profitable, um, which is just my number. The city is built. The pavilions are up. They have rethought things in ways you can't imagine. All the screens are going to be um, holograms and laser holograms going into the sky, so to speak, for presentations. It's now just waiting for the moment where feel, people feel comfortable to travel and are willing to travel to generate the numbers. But I, I'm very excited about Expo 2020. But I don't have to wait. The beauty of this new world that we are in, you know, we have stayed apart but we've come together is my expo 2020 is right here in my living room um you know and that's that's the beauty of it i have yeah. seen more beautiful happy smiling faces like all of yours from around the world in the comfort and privacy of my living room more often than not wearing pajama bottoms even though i have my bow tie on um that, that's that's amazing and when you think about how it is giving the planet a chance to heal um and inflect and slow down, that is remarkable. I'm looking out my window, usually I see a plane every 45, you know, six months ago I would see a plane every 45 seconds. Now I don't see them. And when I think about that reduction in footprint and the whole transition that that's making, there's a benefit there too. So I don't want to go back to normal. The, the reality of my life is, you know, I've spent more time in New York uh, in, by the end of June in 2020 than I spent in all of 2019. And I've struggled. I'm not gonna say it's easy for me, it's not. I'm a tough guy to keep indoors. I'm a tough guy to be around. Um, not that I'm not kind and loving, but you know, I've got some issues. Um, you know, I've got my own work style. And as much as I love my family, I think they didn't realize how much they might not always love me as much, um, but we are coming together. And that's the beauty of this. So I am learning how to work smarter how to work a little more considerate, considerately and also more collegially. And I think this brewing pot, if you will, is really going to get the world to a better place sooner. Um, I wish it didn't come at such a high cost. So let me be very adamant about that. And the degree to which, and here's the deal, you know, Rob touched on this at the beginning. I always like to say the degree to which we resist injustice is the degree to which we are free. Um, so you gotta, you can't just talk about it. You've gotta be about it. You know, let's, let's talk about racism. It is no longer enough to say, I am not a racist. I don't think there are that many racists in the world. I think we have a lot of issues around racism, but we have to be actively anti-racist in all that we do. That's the critical. It's not enough to say, I am not a racist. How am I being actively anti-racist? 
How am I being actively pro-planet in my eating, in my health, in my decisions on a day, on my packaging decisions? These are the things that are ultimately going to get us to a bigger, brighter place. And the opposite of courage, and this, this really requires a great deal of courage. And I think, you know, that's the secret sauce, people. If you want the secret sauce, it's courage. It's testicular fortitude. It's the ability to just really stand up and believe in yourself and, and have a big set of stones. Because the opposite of courage is not cowardice. The opposite of courage is conformity. And for far too long, we as consumers have been beholden to being conforming to the big agenda of big business. So the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it's conformity, because even a dead fish can go with the flow. And none of us here are dead fish. So we really have to find our niche, stand up for it, and, and advocate, and, and, and make decisions. Vote with your fork, vote with your wallet, vote with your mouth, vote at the ballot, and make decisions, and, and thank people, and find your tribe. I, you know, like Rob really inspired me. You know, I know there are certain people who know, they call me, oh, I hate to do it to you, Steve. I'm like, no, it'll be the best part of my day. Um, you know, because I, I got to carve the time, but it'll be worth the time. And when you do that, you are bringing a better benefit to yourself and to your life and to your colleagues and to the planet. And if you bring that to the plate and the way you look at how you eat and share food and talk about food and look at food innovation, you're going to be, we're going to be a better world for it and, and happier, healthy people in the process. Yes. And I think that kids have been always your ally on that. This is Vivian is asking, uh, and I think the question is for both of you, how you do with picky kids that don't want to eat healthy food. And I think that this is uh, something that as soon as I have seen your kids, uh, because I have been in your classroom, that was something happening pretty spontaneously. As soon as you don't tell them you have to eat it because it's going to make you stronger. But as soon as they're going to be the heroes growing this food, right. they're going to be the, part of the process. They, listen, they you don't so proud beat kids of their... into eating healthy eating by, eating by becoming the food police. You make it cool. You make it fun. The interesting thing, too, is, you know, children who are picky eaters, my sense is that on, on this panel or, you know, within our circle here of all these people, there is no one's child here who is really going to go hungry. And, and that's I mean, I'm dealing with populations right now in Sierra Leone where they are really struggling to feed people on a day to day basis. They're eating grass. They're eating twigs. Um, so it's one thing to be picky because we as parents think it's picky. And I think the best way to encourage healthy eating is for you to model it yourselves and to shut off the damn TV. You know, kids are coming to the table with predetermined notions because they're getting them not from you. They're getting them from the competition. And who's the competition? McDonald's, Burger King, Nestle, all those marketing people. You know, I sent a scathing email to Shaquille O'Neal. They have this new shakaroni pizza. I couldn't believe the guy's wealthiest guy in the NBA is out there peddling pizza with pepperoni and cheese to African Americans. He should be ashamed of himself. But that's where they're getting this. So, you know, you have to be smarter than Shaquille O'Neal. And I got news to you. You don't have to be that smart to be smarter than Shaquille O'Neal. You just have to be kinder, more loving, and more present. Um, you know, I think of the cooking lessons I've learned, Sarah, from your children. You know, make sure you the, the pasta and the sauce, the pasta and the sauce are talking. You know, these are things that, that are fun. These are the lifelong lessons that, that, that carry us forward. Um, so it's about being this incredible thing. It's called being a parent, being a steward, being a steward and a parent to yourself and to your children and to your colleagues. And I don't use the word police. I use the word parent and steward. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephen. And so Dr. Robert, Give us the last uh, medicine and food for thoughts for tonight for us. Yeah, I think, you know, when it, again, you know, the theme is about food and education. And I think, you know, the earlier we are exposed, um, just going to the last question too about pig eaters. You know, one of the things that I was blessed with is that my mom, you know, we had two things on dinner, either what, what I made and what, or not. That was it. That's all we had for dinner. Whatever we, whatever my mother made, or that's it. That's all you had. There was no such thing as picky eater. And you know, to Steve's point, you know, there's a lot of hungry kids out there, and 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 
And I think one of the things that we have to start thinking about is how do we feed people healthy food? And I think it has to be going back to the point of introducing them into the kitchen more. And I think this is one of the COVID things. Kids want to play. And there was a great philosopher called John Dewey here. John Dewey, if you look at everybody look into this. I just recently found about him. I heard about him. He's an American philosopher who actually, the whole principle, similar to Steve's, is that it has to be experiential. And he used the cooking and the kitchen as his classroom, as Steve does farming and urban, urban gardening. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to change how people are taught so that if people do better, if they know better, they do better. And unfortunately, that's where the, the gap is. Um, and ultimately, it is our responsibility to take, take action. And I think one thing that we can hopefully come out of COVID with is that it is for us and by us more than anything else at this time. We can't wait for the governments to, to take action. We have to take action. And for the students out there, you know, be the change agents. Because ultimately, like I said, the people that don't get it are going to die. And the people that are going to get it, get it. And the kids that get it right now are going to live longer than ever. So um, I think that's where I like to end it with. And ultimately, yeah. again, I'm going to send you a, a coupon code for this thing that I think kids are, are people are going to love because it's a very simple message. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Guys, really being with us is a gift. And I think we all have been very inspired by your words. And Until your words. next time and I'll say yes. I say, <laughs> and you know that I'm calling you. I'm calling you. I love this time together. This is, this is my fresh prescription. You know, I encourage people. I think everyone is looking for a big answer. And I've got news for you. There is no really big audacious answer here. You know, instead of being the light at the end of the tunnel, as long as we all continue to be the light within it, our worlds expand and our opportunities expand. I'm, I think of all, everybody here knows a happy, healthy vegan. And I, I, I'm looking at Rob because we have a mutual friend who on her laptop, it says, I'm a healthy, happy, healthy vegan. And all of you know someone who is that person who is very meticulous about what they eat, how they steward their lives, and they're happy. They're well adjusted. You can't believe how together they are. And a lot of it has to do because they have moved from healthcare to self-care. And when you are an engaged and active participant in your life, no matter what it is, whether it's yoga, eating, reading, walking, praying, meditating, you are a happier, healthier person and you lead by example. So please, each and every one of you, remember you are the light in the tunnel that we need, not the light at the end of the tunnel that we keep seeking because the end of the tunnel keeps moving but we can continue to illuminate ourselves and each other in an add value capacity on a day-to-day -day basis. So remember, do something today that your future self will thank you for tomorrow. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, thank you. And that's a wrap. <laughs> yes, live light. That's Sarah, light that's Sarah, that's Sarah says light. Okay. Yeah. I guess I get to do one, I get to say a bonjourno for welcome and, and a river derchi until exactly. we see you guys soon. <laughs> this is vintage. You gift me the first time we met many years ago. I so know, I remember. I still have it. You can have a hat. Eleni, I'll get you a hat. Thank you. God bless you. Be God well, everybody. That's the most important thing. Live well, be well. Thank you stay so much. Stay safe and stay much. fresh. That's, what my, yep. that's how I end it. You got I it. I love your statement, Rob. guys. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Good ciao. night. Thank you. Ciao. 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 Grazie, grazie. Ciao. Oh, and see you tomorrow for uh, the next sessions that are waiting for us.